Well, good evening, brethren and sisters and young people. Sunday night can be a bit of a challenge, can't it, after a big day? I was having tea tonight with a, with a brother and he said that he's going to have awful difficulty staying awake tonight. And I said, well, if it was me, I'd be asleep already, so that's fine. But it has been a big day and I, um, I went to the Whispering Wall today and I, was, I walked up one end of the Whispering Wall and I happened to have my notes with me and I thought I'll fan a little quiet spot there and I got my notes out and just um, rehearsed, quietly rehearsed my talk for tonight. And when I got to, when I walked to the other end of the uh, wailing, the wailing wall. <laughs> when I got to the other end, hey? when I got to the other end of the whispering wall, there was a group of brethren and sisters there who were sound asleep. So it works, it certainly works. But there was a group of the public there that were quite riveted. They were very appreciative. So anyway, now you all seem to get on quite well. So that's a bit of a disappointment to me. I was hoping that. Uh, I'd, I'd put this talk on on Sunday night because I, I knew this was your first camp for two years and I thought it's the first time they've been thrown together for two years so all these long-held resentments and differences will bubble to the surface and there'll be a few big arguments take place, maybe a, a few fisticuffs here and there and by Sunday night we'll really need a talk like this. But uh, it seems as though you all get on very well indeed. But on the off chance that one day differences do arise, then hopefully what we consider tonight from the book of Proverbs might be helpful. Because after all, when, when you look around the room tonight, you can't find one single person who is exactly like you. There's not one person here who has the same temperament as you, the same personality, and the same opinions on everything. So... In the course of going through life, as we, as we go through life together, and we're all trying to achieve exactly the same thing, and that's all to try and be like God, our characters are tested and developed as we progress within a community of different people. And so that presents um, different scenarios, doesn't it? That can produce variety, which is very enjoyable, because we are all a little bit different. But it can also uh, produce a lot of annoyance and conflict between us. So how do we go about as we, well, we're all ultimately aspiring for the same thing, and that is to, to, to try and build the character of God into our life, how do we handle the differences that exist in the meantime? How do we resolve those differences in a way that not only gets rid of them, but the actual way we resolve them is reflective of the character that we're trying to develop, which is the character of godliness? And what we're going to do tonight, uh, just briefly, is just look at four uh, pieces of advice that we find in the book of Proverbs, which hopefully uh, might be helpful. And the first piece of advice is that the proverb, well, not necessarily the first in order, but the first we're going to consider tonight is to try and find out firstly if a problem actually exists in the first place. If you just come with me to Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 13 and see what this particular proverb says Proverbs 18 and verse 13 where we read he that answereth a matter before he heareth it it is folly and shame to him now that is an exaggerated impossibility isn't it Someone has reached a conclusion about something that they don't even know about yet. They haven't actually heard about the matter, and yet they've decided the matter. But it's making a very powerful point, isn't it? And the point is about haste. We decide that a problem exists, or we conclude that a person is going down uh, the wrong path, in particular path in life, and we do that based on completely inadequate evidence, or maybe none at all. And we are like a court holding our own little court case in our head based on very little information and maybe no information at all. We've put that person on trial. We can imagine what it would be like if you were charged with a crime and your day in court arises, uh, arrives and you go into the dock and you stand up in court the start of day one of your case and the judge turns to the jury and says, how, foreman of the jury, how do you find the defendant? We define, find the defendant guilty. And you think, well, what sort of legal system is this? There's been no evidence presented. They don't even know what the case is. They don't know what the accusation is. 
and yet they've reached a conclusion already. Now sometimes we do that based on hearing things and sometimes we, base, we do that based on seeing something. Have a look at Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 8. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 8 is an interesting one. And it says there um, in Proverbs 25 verse 8, Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof when thy neighbour hath put thee to shame. Now, how that, how that should be in, in the Hebrew, and some translations have, have got it this way, in fact, quite a number have, RSV, NIV, ESV, do that differently. What, what it is is the end, of, the end of verse 7 should actually be part of verse 8. So the ESV, if you're looking at that now, you'll see that it says, What your eyes have seen, do not bring hastily into court. What your eyes have seen, don't bring hastily into court. So the key words are, I, it's what your eyes have seen, hasty, and in the AV at least, strive. Go not forth hastily to strive. So you see something, you see someone in a, in a place or talking to someone in a certain way, you can't hear what they're saying, but it just appears to be something's happening there, or whatever it might be, you quickly make a decision about what's happened and suddenly you start a fight or a debate or an argument, as the word Hebrew means for strive, about what you saw. And that proverb is a very strong warning against jumping to conclusions and taking positions against someone or something before we know the complete story. That's so easy to do. Because often, when we learn the complete story, it casts a totally different light on the matter. So often we say, well, I saw this, or guess what I heard? And the very next thing we speak about, the very next thing we say is actually incorrect and creates a completely different false impression about something, about someone that leads to problems that would never have existed. And I think we could all agree, life has got plenty of real problems without going to the trouble of creating ones that don't actually exist. We don't need to do that. So in summary, the first lesson that Proverbs teaches us about resolving problems is to find out if there actually is a problem. We might not even have a problem that we need to resolve. It might only exist because you've misunderstood something. Now, what does God do? Well, that is a godly approach, isn't it? God doesn't deal with us without knowing everything about our circumstances. Now, we, we of course, can't know everything about someone's circumstances. But we can do much better than making huge leaps of conclusion about things that we know very little about. That is a very ungodly thing to do. God acts upon a knowledge of a circumstance and we've got to try and do the best we can to be godly. And jumping to conclusions is a very ungodly thing to do. Now that leads on to, in the next couple of verses in Proverbs 25, to what we might say is, is, is a second, uh, a, a second uh, piece of advice in the book of Proverbs and that is, if there is a problem, to contain the problem as much as possible. Let's have a look at Proverbs chapter 25 and let's read verses 9 and 10. Debate thy cause with thy neighbour himself and discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame and thine infamy turn not away. So verse 9 says, debate thy cause. So it's... it's it is my cause. It's something to do with me. This is not something that has nothing to do with me. It is actually my cause. Or as the Hebrew means, that word cause, it's the Hebrew word contest. So it, there is a contest, there's a cause, there's an issue, and it is something to do with me. And that's important, isn't it? Because sometimes we get involved in things that have very little or nothing to do with us. It's none of our business. But not in this proverb. It is my issue. It is something to do with me. But what it says is, it says, discover not um, a secret to another at the end of verse 9. 
Now, most translations have something similar to the ESV. Do not reveal another's secret. Do not reveal another's secret. So it's not my secret. Whose secret is it? It was not my secret. It's the secret of the person that I'm in a, in a, uh, some sort of issue with. The, the person that I'm in this contest or this debate with. That's the person who I'm told not to reveal their secret. So whereas verse 8 was talking about caution versus haste, slow down, don't jump to conclusions, verse 9 is about privacy versus publicity. Privacy versus publicity. So we ask the question, if, if, it is, if the issue is with me, and it is therefore my cause, why do I want to tell someone else about it? Why would I want to tell someone else about it? And, and the answer is, is because what I'm going to do, the person I'm going to tell about it is going to be carefully hand-picked by me and I'm going to pick a person who I know is going to side with me on the issue. They're most likely going to agree with me. I'll pick them for that reason. And then, when I've revealed the other person's secret to them, they're going to agree with me, as I, as I correctly anticipated, and I'm going to feel right, vindicated and justified in my position. Proverbs 18 verse 17 says, The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So in case this thing gets out, I'm going to get, I'm going to get in first, aren't I? I'm going to get in first and make sure my story is out there with people that I have selected, especially because I know that they'll agree with me. Now instead of doing that, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, said in Matthew 18, If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. It makes you wonder, doesn't it, whether he, he a proverb like this, sparked that idea in his mind to make a point like that. It's privacy versus publicity. And it all comes down to what our ultimate aim is, isn't it? If my ultimate aim is to win a victory over someone, to look good personally, then publicity is the way to go because I want to look good in front of as many people as I possibly can. If, however, my aim is to gain that other brother or sister, then privacy will be the course of action that I choose. You look at that picture on the screen of those two little girls. You've got one little girl dying to tell something and the other little girl is dying to hear it. So it's going to be said, isn't it? It's definitely going to be said and it's definitely going to be heard. But the question we've got to ask ourselves is, will telling someone else about this issue, is it going to help me to gain my brother or my sister? Proverbs 11 verse 13 says, A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. That person has the best outcome at heart. So when someone comes to us, well, in the other case, of course, is if someone comes to us with a story, we've got to ask ourselves, will me hearing this help me to gain that brother or sister? That's what we need to ask ourselves. But what happens if we don't do that? What happens if we don't take that approach? Well, what happens is Proverbs 25 and verse 10. Lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. Or as the NIV says, or he who hears it may shame you and you will never lose your bad reputation. Remember that proverb we read, Proverbs 18 verse 17. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So suddenly the very outcome that we were seeking, which was damaging someone else's reputation and elevating my reputation, that has been turned on its head and now... I'm the one, I am the one ashamed before people and certainly before God. So the lesson of verses 9 and 10 is very simple, isn't it? If a, if a difference or a problem really does exist, then try and contain it to those directly involved, whether it's uh, us, whether it's me as the problem, or whether I'm about to be told about someone else's problem. Now, another way of containing the problem is maybe for us to not get involved in the first place. Have a look at Proverbs 26 and verse 17. 
It may be better if I just don't get involved at all. Proverbs 26 verse 17, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. So it makes two important points. Firstly, in that proverb, it's the issue is none of the meddler's business. He is passing by the strife, and the strife doesn't belong to him. The Amplified Bible renders that he who passing by stops. He's just passing by, and he should continue to pass by, because it's nothing to do with him. But something's got his interest, and he stops. And what does he do? He meddles. The margin in my Bible says he's, he becomes enraged. Rotherham says he gives vent to his wrath over a quarrel not his. And apparently in the Hebrew, the emphasis is on the words not his. It is not my issue. And yet I am allowing myself to get totally caught up and emotionally involved in this, this issue. And the proverb says that is like taking a dog by the ears. That is a very dangerous thing to do with any sort of dog. But I would imagine with wild, the wild dogs of the Bible, it would be particularly dangerous. And we'll look at anger a little bit later on. But for, for now, it's especially in relation to something that is none of your business. And if you come across a wild dog, it has the potential to cause trouble, doesn't it? That's something that has the potential to hurt you. I remember when uh, um, we were in Israel some years ago, and we were driving from... Where are we driving from? From the, from the Jordan to Jerusalem. So we're driving along through all this mountainous region, if anyone's been there, and, and someone said, oh, I was with Jack, actually. We were, we were there, and, and he said, and he said, oh, this is where the, um, the parable of the, uh, the Good Samaritan was set. And so we, we pulled over in the car, and I walked up into these hills, and I had my video camera, and I'm just sort of panning around the hills, and then suddenly in the video camera I see this dog about about 100 metres away from me and the dog was on its own and I just got, I, saw, I thought I'm in a pretty scary position here because I looked and the car's about 50 metres away and the dog's 100 metres and the dog is going to do that 100 metres quicker than I'm going to do the 50 but I had the presence of mind on the video camera to actually commentate the moment and I was filming saying there's a dog in the distance I'm actually feeling quite scared at the moment because if that dog turns around and sees me it's going to come hurtling towards me and I'm going to be attacked. And I'm filming this and I was actually going to put the film on this PowerPoint and sh on this thing and show you. But I suddenly realised that when I, I remember, when I got to Jerusalem, I, got my, I was pickpocketed and that camera and the video that I took was stolen. So you'll have to take my word for it. But I had the presence of mind not to run up to that dog and grab him by the ears. That would be a disastrous thing to do. We're going to try and diffuse the situation. I had nothing to do with it. I reacted very calmly and made my way back to the car. But this verse is talking about a troublemaker who has taken the problem with a potential to get worse and has deliberately and foolishly made it worse. He is quite literally a troublemaker. Now, that doesn't mean that we should never try and help others. And there are occasions where we might have to get involved with someone and to help them in an issue that doesn't involve us. But the key is not to try not to become emotionally involved in that. The best way of helping someone may well be to do the exact opposite, to maintain a perspective that they haven't got because they are emotionally involved. Have a look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 14 and 15. See what Peter says about this issue of, of meddling emotionally in other people's business. 1 Peter chapter 4. And Peter says in 1 Peter 4 verse 14 and 15, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of, God, and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? 
There's a little catalogue of sins in which we've got some terrible things, including murder. And he lists with it being a busybody in other people's matters. And the word busybody in the Greek means to meddle, which is a very similar idea to that Hebrew word that we saw back in Proverbs. But it's listed with some very, very serious sins, isn't it? I mean, if someone said to me here, oh, um, have you met Brother Rodney? And I say, oh, no, no, I haven't. What, what's he like? Oh, he's, no, he's a nice brother, a bit of a busybody, but, you know, he, he's, he's nice enough. Oh, I'd think, well, well, whatever, he's a bit of a busybody, that's okay. But if someone said, oh, no, Rodney, he's fine. He, he does tend to murder people occasionally, but other than that, he's, he's, he's all right. I'd, my ears would prick up on that one, wouldn't I? I'd be most interested in that. Very, very different scenario, and yet Peter lists these things together. Have a look at what the Lord Jesus Christ's um, approach was in Luke chapter 12. Just have a quick look here as we go on the way back to Proverbs. Luke chapter 12, the Lord Jesus Christ was presented with a little conundrum. And he was asked to get involved in something. What did he do? In Luke chapter 12 and verse 13... One of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So there's a, there's a real potential for potential blow up there. There's money involved. And Jesus says unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. What a brilliant response. Our Lord was wise enough to know that that is a minefield. There's money at stake. This is a real family blow up. So he doesn't get emotionally involved. He doesn't ask to know the specifics. I mean, he doesn't know much at all after verse 14, <coughs> after verse 13. There's no, there's no talk of amounts or how many other kids are there or you know, who, who's the oldest. He doesn't ask for any specifics. He just simply gives a wise word of advice a general principle that, if it was adopted, would diffuse and resolve the matter. That is very different to becoming party to the quarrel and getting emotionally involved. Now, how do we put God into that principle? Well, if we think of God's dealings with us, God deals with us privately, wherever possible, doesn't he? He, he, he gives us the ability and asks us to pray privately to him we can pray publicly as well but we can go to him and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with God we can pr pray personally and privately and and pour out our heart to him in private prayer and often he responds in ways that others may never know the whole thing is very private and personal and God contains our problems wherever possible and only goes beyond that where necessary for our own good but he doesn't just do that gratuitously for no reason it's best to keep things private and if that's what's in our best interest that's what God does so what have we seen so far firstly determine whether a problem actually exists in the first place secondly if it does contain it as much as possible to those involved thirdly don't allow anger to make the problem worse than it already is Let's come to Proverbs 15, verse 1. Anger. Proverbs 15 and verse 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. In other words, don't, do not add to the problem. And a very good way of adding to the problem is to get angry to get angry ourselves or to cause anger in others because now we've got two problems we've got the initial issue whatever it was and now we've got the anger that now that now circles around the issue we've got to avoid anger i don't know if you've ever seen this quote before written by a, a roman poet 2000 years ago when he said anger is a short madness when you think about it, that's true, isn't it? I, d I don't, like, we've all got problems in life and I've got many problems myself. I wouldn't say anger is really 
one of them. I don't, I don't really think I'm a, a very angry person, but I, I've been angry on occasions enough to know, and, and you, might, you might sort of experience this or agree with this, that when you get angry, it's like as if there's just this moment where you cross a line. Because you're sort of in control, and you're, saying, you're sort of talking normally, and you're sort of framing your sentences in a normal way. It's sort of contained. It's controlled, as, as we generally are when we speak. And then suddenly you just cross a line, like flick a switch, and then suddenly it's all different. And it's like as if you leave yourself. And now you're entering this realm where you could actually do and say things that you wouldn't normally dream of doing, because you're angry. I've crossed the line, and I've become this other person. And I'm potentially out of control. I'm this other person who can contemplate doing things and saying things and speaking in a volume that I would no normally never dream of speaking like that. And as this poet said, it's, it's like a, a little form of madness. It's like you've become mad for a little moment. I remember that one of the most angry um, thing, m moments I ever had, this is going to sound ridiculous, but this was about 30 years ago and I was in a fish and chip shop and... the. <laughs> It seems ridiculous now, but the issue was, I can't quite remember the details, but it was to do with a piece of fish and whether it was supposed to be battered or grilled. And, and we, had, we had ordered it and it, for some reason the order was wrong and the guy behind the counter was disputing it and he wasn't going to correct it. And I, and I, as I say, it sounds ridiculous now, but I got so angry that I came within it just a moment of hurling that fish across the fish, across the fish shop I, can, I remember distinctly hurling that fish across the fish shop into Sister Julie is looking, she's got a, a quizzical look on her face but it's a, there's a look of disgust there and there should be Sister Julie because it was a terrible thing, well I didn't do it but it was a terrible thing to nearly do and the only thing that stopped me was I thought, I actually remember thinking if that fish get, lands in that oil it can, it's going to splash everywhere and this, thing, this place could go up in flames <laughs> that's the only thing that stopped me and uh, anyway, I, so I walked out, but I was, I was so angry. Now you might be saying, you might be saying, well, you've said you haven't got a problem with anger. Maybe you have got a little, little bit of a problem. Maybe a little bit of therapy might help. But um, the thing about anger is, when that moment passes, you're amazed what what you actually were like at the time, and you look back and think, how did I actually say those things? I was, I might have been screaming at the top of my voice or saying things I would never normally say. And you look back and you think, gee, I regret that. I'm amazed I spoke like that. And you might say, well, I'm, so, I'm, sorry, I, I'm sorry I got so angry. I wasn't thinking. It wasn't me. And it sort of wasn't you in a way because you'd had this little moment of madness. I remember when I was a kid, I used to love watching um, The Incredible Hulk <laughs> on TV. And uh, it was a great show. But we probably all know the story of The Incredible Hulk. But... Um, and it's probably not even worth going into, but anyway, I'll, I'll, the story was that the, the, this guy called um, David Banner, he was a scientist, and what he was trying to tap into was, you know, when, when someone has a moment where their adrenaline just pumps through them and they can do, like, superhuman things, or jump through a window or lift a car off someone, and he wanted to tap into that, so he discovered that gamma rays was the thing to get into. And he gave himself a, a, an overdose of gamma rays, and... For the rest of his life, he was in this situation where when he got really angry, he would turn into the Hulk. And then the Hulk would go tearing things around, and he didn't kill people, but, uh, but he, he would break things and cause great destruction, and then he would go back to David Banner, and then David Banner was just horrified when he saw what he'd actually done as the Hulk. And he, it's a little, it's a little bit like that, isn't it? That he, he'd, had, he'd had this moment that was a, a moment of complete madness, and when it was all over, he looked back and said, I can't believe I, I did it. It wasn't me. It was like as if I'd left myself. And so it was. I remember a quote from the show when he said, as, as David Banner, this, this guy was getting him quite angry, and I remember I wrote down the quote, and he said, Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And that was sort of like the theme of the show. Great, great show. Don't go but watching and the Incredible Hulk, but that's an illustration of, what, of the point that I'm trying to make. Now, Proverbs 15 verse 1 set, tells us how to avoid provoking anger or how to calm anger that's already happened because it says a soft answer turns away wrath. So it's not saying 
ignore the problem, is it? It's not saying that, because something it does have to be said. An answer's got to be given, but it's given softly. The pulpit commentary says, firm in substance, soft in language and spirit. And that's a good thing to adopt in our life, isn't it? And one final warning before we move on to the next, ver next proverb is that what we've also got to avoid is what might be described as cool anger. What's cool anger? Well, we might, we might avoid an explosion of temper and avoid raising our voice and carrying on like that. But that might be just out of embarrassment. We don't, we don't do that in front of people and people see what we're like and suddenly we, you know, we, we look like a bit of a fool. So we maintain our anger, but it's cool and it's calculating and it's going to one day seek revenge and it'll probably do it in a worse way than what it would have done originally. Brother Isip Collier picked up on this and he said this. He said, we may congratulate ourselves on controlling our anger when really we've only found a more satisfying way of relieving our feelings. We are cool and collected, not because we've properly ruled our spirit, but because worldly wisdom has taught us a more effective way of striking a blow. And that's so true, isn't it? So we've got to avoid that um, insidious problem as well when it comes to the issue of anger. Let's have a look at Proverbs 29 and verse 11. What does it say here? Proverbs 29 and verse 11. It says, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. A fool uttereth all his mind. The RSV and the NIV say, A fool gives full vent to his anger. And the Revised Version and Rotherham also talk about this anger. So it's more about the anger than the words. I'm angry and I'm going to let it all out right now and I'm going to show no restraint whatsoever. Now the proverb says a better response is a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. Now of course it's not saying he stores it all up until later on when it really builds up. He's going to absolutely lash out. I'll keep it till afterwards. It's not saying that. The, the Rotherham and the RSV put it this way. A wise man, by keeping it back, stilleth it. Keep it back and it might be stilled. It's anger brought under control and overcome, not just deferred for another occasion when it's going to really explode. It's deferred and then it disappears. Now we shouldn't fear, we shouldn't feel that to make our point strongly we need to show anger. We need to master our emotions. And a good thing to do, and you might have done this, and I've, I've done this on a number of occasions where you, not, may, you may not necessarily feel incredibly angry, but you know, you, someone might have said something to you or texted something to you, for example, and you're about to do a quick response. And a good thing to do is set a 10-minute alarm on your phone and think, OK, 10 minutes, that's, that's nothing. If I still feel this way in 10 minutes, then maybe I'll do what I'm contemplating doing. And I've done that on occasions. And in, on every occasion, when the alarm goes off, you can't even remember why, why you set the alarm. You think, what's, what's that gone off for? But even if you can remember, which you probably can, the, 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 the heat has gone out of it. And the text that you were going to send, the phone call that you are going to make, the comments that you are going to do, you just think, ah, it's not worth it. We'll move on from that. And you, and, and you, do, you feel a little bit silly because you think, was I really thinking of doing something about that? And that's just 10 minutes. Imagine what, you know, in a week's time, you'll hardly remember. In a year's time, it's just gone completely. It's ancient history. If 10 minutes is enough to still anger, then that's a good practice to do. And as I say, I, I've done that on a few occasions, and you might have too. But if you haven't, that's a, a suggestion. I, I, can't I didn't think of that. Someone must have read it or heard it somewhere. It's actually a very good thing to do, very useful little thing to do. Have a look at Proverbs 26 and verse 21. Proverbs 26 and verse 21, where we read, As coals are to burning coals, and wood to fire, so is a contentious man 
to kindle strife. So the thing that is fueling the heat isn't the issue that's at stake. It's the person handling the issue. He might not even have started the fire, but he's adding to the fire. How is he adding to the fire? He's adding to the fire by being contentious or quarrelsome, as some, some translations have. This is a person who loves to have a great big argument over something. He's not interested in a gentle discussion, quiet, gentle discussion. He wants heated comments. He wants confrontation. He might think this is an issue for the truth and I'm going to fight for the truth. And he may very well be correct in the opinion that he's got on the issue, but he goes about it in all the wrong, in all the wrong way because the anger becomes more divisive than the issue being discussed. Someone blows up about something and all we remember is the blowing up. I can remember occasions in, in ecclesial life over the years where I, I can't remember what the issue was, but I can certainly remember the blow up. I, I won't even give you... I'd love to... Well, I would love to tell a story. It's quite an entertaining story. I would do it without naming people, but I won't even do that. But I can just remember occasions where I reckon everyone there would remember exactly what happened, but no one would remember what it was about because it was just a big blow up and it was totally unnecessary. Now, what's, why does that happen? What's the motive of the person in 26 verse 21? And the answer, perhaps, is, and I won't turn this up, but in 28 verse 25, it says, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. And that's often what it is, isn't it? It's pride. It is simply pride. It's the love of an argument, and it's the satisfaction of being right, regardless of the issue at stake. Brother Alec Crawford, in his book on Proverbs, he said, Often ecclesial problems have a lot more to do with pride than with the truth. Though we are very good, at making the former look like the latter. It's pride, but we make it look like we're fighting an issue for the truth. And the same can be said for personal disputes as well, as ecclesial disputes. In fact, it's interesting, in the New Testament, the words strife and envy occur in the same context five times. Strife and envy. So often, it's envy that's causing the problem. And we sometimes like to take comfort, in, don't we? And we say, well, you know, Jesus got angry. He really got angry. He did things I wouldn't dream of doing. And so does God. God gets very angry when, when, when the right things are at stake. And it's righteous anger that I'm showing. But the question is, is it really righteous anger? And again, to quote Brother Isaac Collier, when we find an angry man, he is usually not protesting against perversions of divine law. Far more frequently, it is a matter of personal interests or personal feeling. And it's true, isn't it? Arguments start over a particular issue and they continue on and we go on and we might be arguing for 5 or 10 or 15 minutes about it and then it just becomes a matter of pride. And you might have had that experience, I've had that experience, where, you, where you're arguing the issue and then suddenly you realise, hang on, I'm actually wrong here that little moment where you think, oh, I'm actually wrong, I can't think of anything to answer because I think I'm wrong, but it then becomes a matter of pride. And you sort of don't want to end the argument there, but you don't want it to keep going too much, so you sort of try to ease your way out of it in such a way that protects your damaged pride and somehow doesn't let the person know that you now actually agree with them because it's too humiliating. Pride is a terrible thing. And... As, as this fire feeds off wood, says the proverb, so the strife feeds off people. It's not the issue anymore, it's the people and how they're handling that issue. Now what about God? Is God like that? Psalm 103 verse 8 says, Yahweh is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. That's what God's like. And sometimes we equate anger with high moral principles. And we say, the reason I'm angry is because I've got such strong feelings about this thing. And people are, other people aren't so angry because they haven't got the conscience that I've got. I've got strong feelings about this thing, about this moral issue. And yet here we've got God, who's the very source of morality, and he takes a very long time to get angry. He's the source of morality, and it takes a long time before he gets angry. So let's not think 
that we're going to prove our morality by becoming angry about things because we're not doing it. That is not right. We're not being godly when we do that. God, and we can be very thankful for it, takes a long time for his anger to build up. He's a very patient God. And that leads us to the fourth point, and that is to be patient and gentle. Let's look at Proverbs 25 and verse 15. We need to be patient and gentle. Proverbs 25 verse 15. By long, by long forbearing is a prince persuaded and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. Now most translations render the prince with the word ruler. You think of a ruler. A ruler can have his own way. He doesn't have to listen to anybody. A true ruler, and certainly in Bible times, their word happened and they didn't have to listen to anyone they didn't have to change their mind or listen to anyone's argument they were the ones that made the decision and this proverb is talking about our approach to someone in that circumstance now someone in that circumstance is probably not going to change their mind when you give them a different point of view they're certainly not going to do it instantly but they might do it after time and a change in circumstances and giving the matter a little bit more thought. That may bring the change. For example, the ruler could be a person who stubbornly refuses to see your point of view when you're actually right. And they're not going to change their mind. We need to show patience with that person. It might, after all, be an issue that you took years to appreciate. Sometimes we're, we're arguing about something, and if we took a moment to think, well, hang on a minute... I might be talking to I'm 56, I might be talking to a 30 year old and I'm talking about this thing and I think, well, hang on, what was my view when I was 30? Before I get really angry about this thing or get too worked up about it, my 30 year old, when I was 30, I was exactly the same. And what changed? Well, it was, it was time and maturity and circumstances of life made me see the thing that I'm trying to, to, to explain to this person now. It might take them a little bit of time as it took me a little bit of time. So be patient and be gentle. And it says a soft answer breaketh the bone. Stirring up anger will very rarely, if ever, produce a positive result, will it? Very few people ever change their mind because they lost an argument, and certainly not when they lost a big argument. It may be that it takes time and circumstance and gentleness and patience for that person to see what we're talking about. Brother Isaac Collier again, such wise words. He says, even if we have to let an opponent have the last word, it is wise to leave off the matter before it turns into quarrelling. If the opponent is reasonable, he will think of what we have said and will affect him far more in this quiet meditation than in the heat of battle. All experience shows that the strong argument gently presented will prevail. Now again we ask the question, is God like that? Well, 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promises, but he bears patiently with you, his desire being that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what he's like. And we know that in Galatians chapter 5, when it lists the fruits of the Spirit, one of them is the fruit of gentleness. That comes from God. God's gentle. And when we're patient and gentle, even in the face of provocation, we're not being weak. We are being like God. And it's good to think of that, isn't it? Because if we think we're being weak, there's enormous pressure to do something different and do what we think is stronger. But when we're being patient and gentle, we're in fact being godly. So in summary and to finish, what have we seen? We've seen that the book of Proverbs gives us four different things that we need to do to resolve differences. Firstly, we've got to establish if a problem exists at all. If it does, then we need to contain it as much as we can. Don't let anger make the problem even worse and be patient and gentle. Now when you look at that, you look at those four things. Isn't that exactly how we want God to deal with us? We would love to think that God 
would deal with us in that way. Because we all know when we assess our lives in a private assessment of our own walk, we know that there are enormous differences between us and God. Talk about trying to resolve differences. The differences between us and God are massive. God has got big problems with our current state. Big problems that he can't even look at. They're so bad. He's got every right to blow us off the face of the map. Every right to do that. Every right to get angry and every right to just end it now. But isn't it a comfort when you look at those four things, especially when you, you, you're in your lowest moments, and we all have these moments where we get so low, where we feel as though we, are, we have drifted so far from God, and we think, it's just so far back. The mountain is too big to climb. God has surely lost interest in me. I keep doing this over and over again. I keep making the same mistakes or different mistakes. I am so far from God. It just seems such a long way back. Isn't it comforting to know that that is exactly how he handles that problem? He contains it. He doesn't get angry. And he's patient and he's gentle. It's just so comforting to know that that is not just four little points that are in a book about you know tips for life or what you know all those other books we saw on the shelf the other day that is actually how god himself handles the the issues that he has with us and we can be just so so thankful for that but if that's the case then surely the very least we can do in response is to handle the much smaller differences that arise between ourselves in the same way when you think of how far you, you, you drift from God sometimes, there's nothing like that that exists amongst ourselves. The very least we can do is take that approach amongst each other. And if we do, then God will happily take that approach with us. And I'd just like to finish with taking some words, just um, some words from uh, one of our hymns, hymn 341. Brethren and sisters, let us walk together in the bonds of love and peace, when we think how much our Father has forgiven, we should learn to live free from wrath and strife. Happy are we when in this we all agree.